Okay, Jack. Uh, this is Jack Hansen. We're in Morro Bay today. Uh, Jack, tell us uh, where you were born and what year. And I was born in uh, Seattle uh -huh. at uh, 1930. I was uh, actually raised in the fishing community of Ballard, which is in north uh, north end of Seattle, where you couldn't live there if you didn't have a Scandinavian name like Hansen or Peterson or Swenson. But everybody there was fishermen. And I lived there for 18 years before I migrated down to Long Beach. Mm. Uh, your father was a fisherman too? My father was a fisherman and a boat builder. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, from Denmark? Yeah, he originally he immigrated from uh, Denmark in the, I'd say right around uh, 1918, something like that. Mm -hmm. But he learned his boat building trade. He was a car learned the carpenter trade in Denmark, but he became a boat builder uh, after he came to uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know why he came to the U.S., why he chose it? Yeah, he did. Uh, he, he told that to me that uh, he was around 16 years of age, and if he stayed, he would have, they had compulsory military training where he would have to go in the Army for two years, and none of the kids there wanted to do that. So. Mm -hmm. If the family could come up with enough money, they shipped him off to the United States. Oh. Mm -hmm. And that's why he came. Mm -hmm. And he intended to go back home uh, like two or three years later after he made some money. And uh, he wrote a couple letters, he said. And he did go home after 55 years. Mm -hmm. His mom and dad were, of course, dead. And, but he did find his family, his brothers and everything, mm -hmm. and that he had never contacted with mm -hmm. since he had left there. Oh. How about yourself? Have you, you been back? No, I've always wanted to go there, but I never made it. I have still a lot of a lot of relatives there, but mm -hmm. I've never had the chance to go. How about uh, brothers and sisters? One stepbrother. Mm -hmm. He uh, he fished with uh, my dad and myself for a few years, and then he uh, he went in the merchant marine, and uh, then he worked went to work on tugboats. He got out of the fishing industry. Oh. You mentioned uh, coming to Long Beach. Right. Yes. We. Uh, it was roughly 1949. Um, we'd been fishing albacore mostly up off of Oregon uh, and uh, Vancouver Island. And uh, that year there was no albacore showed up there and we heard albacore were showing up good down off of Mexico and California. So we uh, we just built a brand new boat and uh, we left Seattle and ended up in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. Left the boat there, boat never returned back to Seattle again. How about uh, during World War II? Did you fish during World War II? Yes, I did. Uh -huh. when, when did you start fishing? I started fishing uh, when I was nine years old in 1939. My mother passed away and um, I had no other option but to do what my dad did and I, uh, he was a fisherman and so I had to go with him. Yeah. Was that your, essentially your schooling then uh, yep. as a fisherman? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was uh, that, that fishing and boat building, and I, I built boats with him, and everything he did, I did, because uh, we were together for, uh, until he was 89 years old, he passed away. But uh, we built a lot of boats together and fished together for years. What uh, was Long Beach like at that time? Long Beach was a real nice town. It's, uh, it was a place that a person would want to live, but not anymore. It's, it's uh, completely changed. It's uh, nothing like it was at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you birth in uh, San Pedro then, or in Long Beach? Terminal Island. Terminal Island. Island. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, tell us about uh, fish processing back in, in those well, days. Well, when I when I first got down there uh, in San Pedro, Terminal Island, there was 22 or 23 canneries at that time. Not only in uh, Terminal Island, but also in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. And I, the last one just closed up, I think, this last year. But there was 22 canneries down there, going wide open, canning everything, tuna, sardines, anchovies, mm -hmm. squid, whatever. Do you recall the, the names of some of these facilities? Yeah, Franco Italian, uh, South Pacific Cannery, uh, well, um, Starkist, San Diego, there was High Seas Cannery, which actually became, uh, French Sardine became, French Sardine became Starkist, or Starkist Cannery. Mm -hmm. Van Camps and mm -hmm. the major canneries. Mm -hmm. One would imagine it was rather uh, aromatic, uh, you know, 
It was. <laughs> we'd come down, there was so much acid in the air, we'd come down to the boat in the morning when it was lightly light fog and the boat would be, the white paint would be totally gray oh. from the acid coming from the canneries. Mm -hmm. And then after the sun came out and warmed up, the boat would turn back to white again. It was uh, un amazing what took place in that oh. Dermal Island. Yeah, that was uh, quite an era of oil production too there. Oh yeah, in that region yeah, as well. Was, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Huntington Beach and everybody had an oil well in their backyard practically then. Mm -hmm. So how long did you stay in Long Beach? I stayed there about 25 years oh. in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I moved up here in 1977. My father died in 1975 and I ended up getting a divorce and moving up here. I first uh, came to Morro Bay to deliver fish, I believe it was 1951. And uh, I loved the place then. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I came in here several times. Uh, uh, before I eventually moved here, but uh, I was like Morro Bay. Yeah. Uh, when you moved here in 77, uh, where did you live? I lived on the boat for a while, and uh, then I got an apartment. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, since I've been here, I, I've gotten married to the former mayor mm -hmm. of Morro Bay. Kathy fished with me for about eight or ten years. She, uh, she had a sport fishing landing here and a sport boat called the Flyer. And uh, she was kind of having a hard time and she asked me if uh, she could go fishing with me sometime to see uh, if she could cut it. And mm -hmm. She did, she was one of the best crew members I ever had. She was really good. Yeah, she's had quite a career. Yeah, she has. Yeah. I'd like to interview her as well. Yeah, right. She's uh, on the younger side of things. but uh, Yeah. Uh, uh, well, anyhow, when you came here in 77, mm -hmm. and uh, what were you fishing then? I was fishing strictly albacore. Mm -hmm. It just, uh, I think it was 1979 that I first started fishing salmon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe we were, we were, yeah, we were harpo harpooning swordfish at the time too, oh. at that time, mm -hmm. 1977. But uh, mostly albacore. We, uh, that was our main fishery since I started fishing with my father in 1939. Up until, uh, say, 77, that about all we ever did fish was albacore. Yeah. So we're on board the Darlene. Did you have this boat at that time? Yes, uh huh. We built, my father and I built this boat down in Wilmington, uh, California, 1960. Oh. That and makes built, it pretty special. And, yeah, yeah. We built uh, three or four boats roughly this size after. We built the Darlene, mm -hmm. built them uh, to sell, actually. Who's the Darlene named after? My daughter, my oldest daughter, Darlene. Mm -hmm. We had another boat that we built after this one that was uh, about two feet longer. It was 54 feet long that uh, was named the Ron H. That was named after my oldest son. But uh, we never did. Uh, <clears throat> finished building enough to name for the rest of my four four kids. We, uh, I've got a daughter, Karen, that lives back in Vermont. She's a school teacher, and my youngest son, Johnny, is uh, taking over the boat now. He's started running it and doing a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, give us the dimensions of the boat, if you would. The boat's uh, 52 foot overall, 16 foot beam, six, uh, six and a half foot draft. Mm -hmm. Carries, I've had 25 and a quarter ton of albacore in it. It's all refrigerated. Mm -hmm. Carries uh, 2,000 gallons of diesel, uh, 240 gallons of water. It That's a rather beamy boat. It's probably a good, yeah, good it, platform. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's always been a good boat. It's got a 220 horsepower Cummings diesel in it, which has been there for practically since the boat was built. Mm -hmm. It looks like you're gearing up right now for salmon. Yeah, we'll be getting ready for salmon now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what other fisheries do you uh, participate in with this boat? Well, we'll go, we'll, uh, as soon as the salmon starts to slow down and hopefully the albacore show up, we'll be fishing albacore and swordfish, mm -hmm. harpoon swordfish. Mm -hmm. You're doing primarily a sword, or a harpoon now? 
Yeah, we were gill netting swordfish and we gave it up. It's mm -hmm. uh, too stressful. Oh. <laughs> and why is that? It just is. It's too. Uh, it's the worst fishery I've ever gotten into. It's. Uh, you can't relax for a minute. You've got a net that costs fifteen thousand dollars out in the water, and you set it out, and it's blowing five knots. And you wake up at one o'clock in the morning; it's blowing forty, and you've got to get that net back on the boat. You can't let it go. Just. Uh, Hang on a second. We lose something. Um, yeah, I imagine part of that stress is just the fact that you have to. It's a nighttime fishery. Yeah, it is. It is a nighttime fishery. Yeah, yeah. you got to have the gear out, uh, sun up. Yeah, you worry about the freighters and running over you and the net and everything else, and it's uh, mm -hmm. just, it's absolutely no fun whatsoever. Yeah. How about harpooning? Harpooning, I enjoy, really yeah. enjoy harpooning. I always yeah. have. It's probably the most adventurous type of fishing there is. It's mm -hmm. uh, how do you spot your fish? We stay up either in the crow's nest, up on top of the mast, or on top of the cabin. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've always been fortunate up here. We're one of the very few boats that do harpoon swordfish uh, north of Point Conception. That when some on the, another boat sees them, see the swordfish on the surface, they will call us, and so that's been a big help too. So we don't always have to find them ourselves. Yeah. We've had other people calling us and mm -hmm. helping us with it. What's uh, the biggest swordfish that you've harpooned? Uh, I'd say in the 300 pound class. Mm -hmm. Kathy and I did get a, a swordfish in the gill net that was 707 pounds. Wow. Dressed. Or dressed. Dressed. It's a nice payday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you fish albacore still? Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, anything else? Any other fisheries? That's about it, really. That's, uh, that's about it. That's, everything's a permit fishery now. Then if you don't have the permit, you can't do it. And that's all we've ever done, really, is the salmon and swordfish and mm -hmm. albacore. We haven't gotten into any rock cod or any other type of fishery like but that. I do recall, though, you, you fished uh, gill net, set gill nets for halibut. Yeah, we did that. We did that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long did you, did you fish uh, halibut? I'd say about five years, mm -hmm. five, six years, mostly when Kathy was with me, um, that's when we fished halibut. Yeah. We, we did fish squid. We were the first boat that ever fished squid down out of San Pedro with lights and hand scooped. Mm -hmm. Not purse sanding. We weren't the first one to do that for squid, but we mm -hmm. were the first boat that ever start, we started that fishery uh -huh. with this boat really? in roughly 1961. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you and Kathy produced a number of educational videos, uh, including gill netting and other yes, things. Yes, we did. Uh, yeah, Kathy was uh, real yeah. good at that. We we have uh, had videos. We had a fire at our home, and we uh, we lost quite a few of them. I I think we still have some, but we we had educational videos on harpooning swordfish, gill netting halibut, fishing salmon, trolling for albacore, slime eels. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, different fisheries we mm -hmm. had. I think that's really great because, as you know, things like slime eels kind of came and went. It yeah, it a, did. It was a yeah. flash there for a few years, and then yeah. mm -hmm. hear anything about it anymore. No, but, uh, but they're still there. There's, <laughs> yeah, there's, the animals are still there. Yep. Certainly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and you've also been a past pres president of the Morro Bay Commercial Fishermen's Organization. Yeah, I was. Um, the first fishermen's meeting I came to when I moved up here in 77, I went to a commercial fishermen's association meeting and uh, the first one I went to, I, I left there as the president of the association. I, I was the president for six years. I was also the board of uh, director for Western Fishboat Owners Association from Morro Bay for roughly six years also. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was involved in the fisheries issues in San Pedro and there too. Mm -hmm. I was the president of the California Commercial Fishermen's Association in San Pedro for quite a few years. Hmm. Well, you seem to be very interested in education. I mean, nonprofits as educational entities. So. Right. Yeah. Well, that's where you could see there was no f the future was getting real poor in this industry and. Mm -hmm. 
we were starting to get a bad name for reaping and pillaging, I guess you'd call it, or the ocean, and which we weren't and have never had, you know, we've never had just more fish in the ocean now than when I started fishing 60 years ago. I'm surprised, I guess, because fishermen don't design fisheries management plans, but you seem to be the one that gets punished when they go wrong. Right, and yeah, we're the bad guys, yes, yeah, yeah. supposedly. Well, yeah, well, some of us don't agree with that. No, so. no. <laughs> um, so how have things changed in Morro Bay since 1977? Well, town's growing, more tourists. Mm -hmm. Tourists, that, like 1977, uh, I think maybe you'd see uh, a couple cars on the weekend from Bakersfield or Fresno. But now uh, on the weekends, it's all you see. A lot of tourists. But the city's improving, I, I think. it's uh, There's more slips, more city slips for the boats to tie up, more mm -hmm. better facilities. Still has a long ways to go, though, Yeah. compared to a lot of other towns. It seems that one of the, the major changes a few years ago was the proposition or a ballot measure that, that uh, made this area of the harbor, the north end. Yeah, Measure D, Measure yeah. D, I think it was called, was from Beach mm -hmm. Street to um, Coleman Drive, yeah. I guess. And that created right. pretty much a commercial fishing zone. Uh, right, zone. Yeah, yeah, I think um, mm -hmm. Joe Giannini was instrumental in that, and, and the Morro Bay Commercial Fishermen's Association was too. Yes. Well, it seemed like a very wise thing to do in retrospect. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's kind of saved it from not too many gift shops and mm -hmm. Chinese imports from Beach Street yeah. West. I know you, uh, every year I see you barbecuing fish at the at the. Uh, I did. I Harbor don't do it Festival. anymore. I, I yeah. gave it up, but um, I, I did that for years, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you were there last year because we, we shared a few jokes, I oh, think. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I was there, but I don't think I was barbecuing. Oh, okay. Well, you were there. That was yep. good. You know, um, I, you know. I share your sense of humor. I, I like a good joke once in a while. <laughs> I know you guys do too. So, what do you see for Morro Bay? What's the, what's the future here? Are you gonna I keep, don't know. The fishing, fishing industry. Uh, I'm about out of the fishing industry myself. I'm aging myself out of it here. Mm -hmm. But I'm fortunate. I've got a son that wants to do it, and I, I'm not too. Uh, I don't know how to word it, but uh, I feel kind of sorry for him, really, stepping into fishing at a time like this where I don't think that he could uh, fish steady now and buy a home, raise a family. I don't think he could do it anymore. Yeah. If you can, it would uh, be awful hard. But uh, I don't know, just fishing is just overregulated. Bad, a lot of bad science. Mm -hmm. Who's that? I got a drug deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, One second. Don't interfere with that. No. <laughs> no. Vitamins, probably. Yeah. Both. Talking. Ta yeah. Talking. What happened? About, um, how, did, did they find the body? Okay. Okay. You haven't heard anything, huh? Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. So what's going on? I know mm -hmm. it's more common well, fishery mm. than harpooning, which is real important to get the details on that. But mm -hmm. we we'll probably will get a chance to hear from yeah. the folks you know, mm -hmm. the techniques that they use. Okay. All right. Bye. To tow it? Hi there. Sorry, I'm late. That's you. okay. Okay, go to uh, U-Haul. I need to pull You know where the U-Haul is? You sure? That should be an adequate time. Right, right uh, by uh, Morro Bay Boulevard okay. and Quintana. Okay. You know where that is? Hmm. And tell them that you want a, a, a towing hitch to tow a car. Huh? Say that. No, 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 no. It goes on the bumper. It just goes on your bumper. Uh, he, he might ask you what kind of car you have. Yeah, tell him you got a forerunner, and you want to get a, a tow bar. Uh, it'd probably be around twenty dollars. I'm guessing, a day.
several techniques. Uh -huh. So, uh, first of all, Jack, I wanted to ask you about the fleet size in, in 1977 when you first came here and compared to what it is now, how, how that's changed. I'd say the fleet uh, since 1977 is about a half the size that it was, mm -hmm. especially the smaller vessels. Uh, they're gone, most of them. Smaller meaning? Smaller rock cod boats, small, you know, like uh, 30 footers and things like that. Most yeah. of the boats now are draggers or mm -hmm. larger uh, salmon or larger albacore boats. Yeah. The, um, and the fishery has changed quite a bit too since 77. A large portion of the boats that fished albacore, a good portion of them were uh, live bait boats. They carried live bait and mm -hmm. uh, they didn't. They didn't. They did troll at times for their albacore, but the, most of the fish that they caught were uh, caught using bait, live bait, and with uh, squid and bait poles, which is what we used to do. We did that for uh, years, and then we got out of that and went to strictly trolling. And uh, now we're in the process of starting to go back bait fishing again. So <clears throat> the last couple of years the bait boats have done uh, the few that are left around have done much better than the boats that are trolling so mm -hmm. we are switching back to that uh, sardines primarily is bait anchovies and anchovies. sardines mm -hmm. um, mostly anchovies if you can get them but sardines also uh -huh. and uh, how far offshore are you fishing primarily it's been the last couple of years has been fairly close uh, I don't think anybody is really going out much over from Morro Bay over 50 60 miles mm -hmm. I'd say the biggest percentage of the fish have been around 30, 35, 40 miles. Some seem to think that the Clean Water Act and, and some improvements in uh, sewage disposal have improved the water quality. Do you think that's a, a factor? I think so. I think so. I, I don't think it's ever been checked really to see how far the pollution and things go offshore and if it does have an effect on say like the albacore, I'm sure that it would on salmon because they're right on the beach, right on the bottom. And that's where most of your pollution ends up, is yeah. on the bottom and close to the beach. And uh, that's where most of your salmon are. Do salmon seem to be in closer as well? Not really, no. Mm -hmm. Salmon seem to stay about the same. Yeah, yeah. they kind of go more for the water temperature and thermal climate. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Well, let's do albacore. Um, how about swordfish? Do um, you see any changes in their migration patterns? Or? Not really, no. Mm -hmm. They're. Uh, it's it's really hard to say. There's used to be a lot more harpoon fish than there is now, mm -hmm. and nobody can really understand it. A lot of the guys, a lot of the guys that have never uh, gill netted swordfish, blame it on the gill netters taking too many swordfish yeah. with the gill nets, which is possible. Yeah. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. We have no scientific evidence to prove it. Mm -hmm. But there is still a still swordfish but the swordfish is a it's a good weather fishery it has to be calm to, to find them mm -hmm. how about uh describing albacore fishing to us just uh you know uh, like a day on the albacore grounds what would that be like well um i would give you an example as uh, as of leaving here in the morning at uh, before daylight and getting out around 30, 35 miles and putting the gear in the water. We, our outriggers drop down. We have our uh, about four lines on each pole on the outriggers that drop down on each side and we start trolling. And a lot of that fishery, uh, albacore fishery is uh, done on the radio. Somebody, especially the uh, local uh, trailer boat fleet mm -hmm. is the fastest boats they're out there before we are they usually find them before us and they're not bashful about getting on the radio and talking about it and most of the time the boats will hone in on them where they found fish already rather than wasting fuel and going prospecting looking yourself mm -hmm. so um, and like we'll spend the day or we don't like to go out there just for the day we'll spend uh, you know, five or six days out there mm -hmm. fishing. And what's a good day or a good trip? We've, uh, it varies. I mean, we've had 12 ton days. We've had uh, 11 ton days mm -hmm. bait fishing, you know, in previous years. But 
uh, a good day now is 100 fish, mm -hmm. depending upon the size. Yeah. And the fish the last couple of years have been large, mm -hmm. up in the 20, 25 pound class. Mm -hmm. So if you get 100 fish a day, you're doing fine, that's good. The price isn't great, which is, we've come to live with that. It's, it's not, you're not gonna get rich anyway fishing. Well, is the market stable enough now where you're not having to run all over the coast looking for a place to offload? It's, it's uh, helped some with uh, Driscoll moving to town. Mm -hmm. I'd say it, it's helped a lot. He's even talking about building a small cannery. Heard that. Mm -hmm. I think where he could ton, uh, he could pack roughly six ton of fish a day, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. would be a great help to the yeah. industry, I think. Yeah. That's our problem is we, we've lost all our canneries, not because of they couldn't make a living, it's because of the government not putting imports on the imported tuna. So we're, uh, all the fish now is just about frozen and uh, put in containers and ship to uh, Samoa or some other, Chile or Ecuador, wherever, you know, that mm -hmm. nothing is canned here mm -hmm. because of labor. Uh, it appears that albacore stocks have improved over the last decade since the uh, limits on the Asian high sea drift net fishery. Is I'd that say so. Opinion? I would say so. Yeah. I think they, the, they were interfering with the, the track of the fish more, more than the take of the fish, they were out there in the in the dividing zone where the albacore will come and make their split whether they're going to go to Vancouver or go to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I think that was interrupting the, the process of the, the fish with all the, the gear that they had out there. Mm -hmm. They're still doing it, you yeah. know, it's not completely stopped, but it's uh, it seemed to have helped what the government's done to mm -hmm. try to put a stop to it. Does anybody know yet where the albacore go to spawn? No. Does anybody know how to distinguish a male from a female? No, not that I know of. Isn't that interesting? No. Uh, like I say, I've started in 1939 and mm -hmm. I've never uh, seen an egg or a baby yeah. albacore, you know, or I've never seen it. What's, what's the smallest albacore you've ever seen? About a pound and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fit and right in the palm of your hand. How about the biggest one? Biggest, Kathy and I had one that was 73 pounds. Mm. Mm -hmm. That was the largest one I think we've ever gotten. Yeah, that's a lot of sandwiches. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Feed a lot of kids. Yeah. 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 Uh, how about um, salmon? Give us a little rundown on what a salmon trip is like. Yeah. Salmon in Morro Bay is like a, it's a homeboy fishery, really. It's a, we're very fortunate here because we can just go out, leave our house and come down to the boat daylight or before daylight in the morning and uh, just leave and go out here a couple of miles and start fishing. Mm -hmm. Or we don't have to run to San Francisco, hopefully. Yeah. But uh, we'll go out here and spend the day fishing salmon. It's uh, quite a bit like uh, trolling for albacore, but it's... Uh, use the outriggers and everything and but uh, you heavy leads and things and you lose, use a lot more hooks and things like that in the mm -hmm. salmon fishery. You have a somewhat different array of, of lines and yeah. hooks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, can you just describe the reason be, be, you know, for the uh, different weights that you use? Well yeah we use uh, a 50 pound weight which goes down and it has uh, we use wire on that to that lead and you can get different increments in the spacing of the uh, line stops. This gets kind of involved. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit hard yeah, to describe. It yeah. But it's uh, the line stops, they can come either a fathom and a half or two fathoms or three fathoms. And I'd say the average boat uses three fathom wire, three fathom stops. And that means every 18 feet, you can put a hook, mm -hmm. a leader and a hook depending upon uh, the depth of water that you're fishing in. So they, uh, the, uh, we use a 50 pound lead, which would be the closest one to the boat. And then uh, we'll use like a 30 pound lead on the outside of that one. And we put uh, a float on that lead till we float that lead back away from the other, the 50 pound lead, so they don't tangle. Mm -hmm. 
and then uh, we'll use it like a 20 pound lead on another float and put that way behind the 30 pound lead. And we separate the leads that way mm -hmm. so they don't tangle. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can, if, uh, we can have 100 hooks in the water at one time fishing salmon. But we're, like albacore, we only have uh, eight or 10 hooks mm -hmm. fishing at a time. Yeah. And then you have a power uh, hydraulic gurney here. Yes, to, we to have gurneys that pull the uh, the leads up, mm -hmm. and um, we also have gurneys that pull the albacore in too. Also. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is the boat underway when you're yes. trolling? Yes. Yeah, we're moving. Trolling is moving. <clears throat> so Salmon, we troll about two knots. And albacore, we about five and a half. Faster fish. Yeah, mm -hmm. salmon are a slow-moving fish. Do other uh, tunas commingle with uh, with albacore? Very few. Uh, we get a lot of bluefin mixed with the albacore, but bluefin uh, don't. I don't know what the deal is, but they just don't like to bite a hook very well. Mm -hmm. Even live bait, the I don't know. Um, there's KG. something there that. He's told them not to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, have you ever caught any of the really huge uh, bluefin? Not really large. Uh, we've had them up to 100, 125 pounds, mm -hmm. but nothing uh, like the three to 400 pound glass. Yeah. Nothing yeah, like that. Yeah, those are pretty exciting. Yeah. Big as a piece of furniture. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we don't really care to catch one of those. Yeah. It's too damage. much to handle. Uh, do more damage than, the, than they'd be worth. Mm -hmm. Um. Tell us about any of your feelings on uh, politics and, and fishing. You, you mentioned that science is not very good. Uh, no, I don't believe it is. I don't think there's anybody, I don't care who it is, knows how much fish is in the ocean. They, uh, they guess, they extrapolate, they do uh, hocus pocus. Uh, figuring on how much fish is in the ocean and, and it's uh, it usually seems to be done on the negative side, uh, like there's a lot less than than what there is for some reason, whether it's for environmental purposes or what, I have no idea, but like I said before, there's, I, there, there's as much fish in the ocean now as when I started 60 years ago, so. Mm -hmm. One of the problems it seems to be for uh, salmon is just your market price, that your, your fuel costs, all your fixed costs are up, that you, essentially well, get the same price as 20 years ago. Yeah, well, same for albacore, same thing. We're, we're fishing for 20-year-old prices, you know, and here everything is, uh, we go in the store and we're getting a, a 75 cents a pound for our albacore and we go up and we're paying $3.29 a pound for a pound of hamburger. You know, things just don't work yeah. out. Well, in the albacore, you go buy albacore in a grocery, it's seven, eight, nine bucks. Yeah, so. yes, yes. Look, yeah. salmon too. And, yeah. What's really hurt the salmon industry is the farm salmon. It's really hurt. Mm -hmm. When I first started fishing salmon, you couldn't get a fresh uh, a piece of salmon until the first of May. Now it's there year round, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's coming from Chile. It's coming from Canada. Some of it from Maine, but it's uh, it's not the same. Farm salmon and wild salmon are completely different species, and people just don't realize what they're buying when they're buying farm salmon. Why do you think it is that uh, institutions like the Seafood Council weren't able to really get that message across to the public? I don't know. It's uh, it's really hard. I there I see now uh, they're trying to get labeling on where anything that isn't produced uh, as wild salmon has to be labeled such, you know, as what as farm salmon. But I don't, I don't know. Price seems to control everything, and that's what people are concerned about, you know. They, they don't look at a salmon, uh, a fillet in the market like a fisherman does, and, yeah. you know, if you look at a farm salmon compared to a wild salmon, there's no comparison in the meat at all, you know. So do you think uh, outfits like Driscoll's will, uh, will really help the local fleet over time? Oh, I think they will. I think they will, especially if they buy local fish, mm -hmm. you know. And try to stay away from. I I realize in the winter time it's hard for them to catch and get anything other than farm fish. Yeah. You know, 
but uh, if if they can uh, do as much as they can buying local local caught fish, it, it will help everything. Well, I see where in the newspaper the local restaurants aren't going to serve uh, sea bass from Chile now. Yes, because it's that. supposedly endangered. So yeah. they obviously have some discretion on what they serve. And yeah, um, do, you, do you think you have? an audience there with them that you might be able to educate them on local products versus imports? I don't know. I think a lot of this uh, restaurant stuff is coming from uh, the aquarium in Monterey. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is uh, because they're putting out good and bad sheets on, on fish that they feel, the aquarium feels it's endangered. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's going to the restaurants. And mm -hmm. I understand that one of the fish on that uh, list is a mythological fish. It doesn't even exist. Did yeah. You, did you hear that one? I've heard that. Yeah. So they're not really doing their research. They're just uh, accepting well, that's what somebody tells bad them. Bad science. You know, we got a lot of that. You know, and it seems so easy to do that they. Uh, and it really hurts. It really yeah. hurts the fishing industry. Yeah. You know. I. You know, I'm curious why there's such a intent on injuring the the fishing industry. I, you know, I grew up in it and I don't know, I always thought of fishermen as good guys. It seems like the last few years you Yeah, I, I, I can look back to like when my kids were small and I used to take the movies to the grade school and show it and uh, my daddy's a fisherman and all the kids were old and odd, you know. Mm -hmm. Now. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite the same, is it? Yeah, yeah. you get booed. Yeah. You know, you you mentioned getting r uh, real films from uh, Starkist and right. going to schools. So tell us about that. Yeah, my kids uh, Starkist when they were going big in in San Pedro Terminal Island. There they they had a, a library, a film library, and I used to go and get uh, borrow a film from them. It was called The Voyage of the Starkist. It was uh, on tuna fishing at. Uh, the boat left from San, Di uh, San Diego and went all the way down to Ecuador and Peru uh, fishing tuna and a uh, very educational movie. Uh, kids just loved it, like third and fourth graders, they, uh, they used to love to watch that movie. Mm. And uh, I think that's one way to get people interested in, in uh, yeah. what fishing is really about. Right. And, you know, I was very taken with the gillnet film that you and Kathy produced a few years yeah. ago. I have a copy of that. Uh -huh. It was, you know, excellent. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because it, it really dispels a lot of the myths about gill netting. Now, yeah. Whether people listen or not, that's the other thing. Yeah. It's such a bias these days. Yeah. So how do we fix that? I don't know. Ideas? I don't really know. It's uh, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. it, it's like the environmentalists, they, they, they want to eat, but they don't want to kill anything. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you're going to eat, you have to. <laughs> I think uh, you know this project is is partially funded by the uh, Central Coast Maritime Museum Association, and that may be one way to uh, inform people about the local fleet. Uh, yes. Hopefully, uh -huh. someday they'll have a museum here. And I hope so. We'll we'll all be in it. Yeah. Have a little you know we'll have a stuffed over in the corner somewhere. Right. Yeah. 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 I've got some caulking cotton down there <laughs> they could put in my cheeks. There you go. <laughs> um, on a lighter note, uh, or maybe a, you know, what's what's the the, the the strangest thing you've ever seen while you're fishing, or the cu most curious thing you've ever seen? Curious? Yeah. We've had a lot of things happen out there that, uh, one thing that still amazes me is this took place, I'd say roughly in 1955, we left Morro Bay. And uh, my dad and myself on our other boat, the boat we had prior to this one, the Margie, we had for 14 years, which was uh, about four feet smaller than this one. And we were, uh, I'm trying to, I, I could be wrong about this, uh, someplace off of uh, Monterey. And uh, we, uh, in those days we had the AM radio, we didn't have VHF radio like we had now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had two channels, 2638 and 2738, and that was all. And whenever a guy used the radio, you heard him. Mm -hmm. 
and those radios up uh, or those old AM radios really uh, transmitted they were good for three four hundred miles well there was a a boat came on the radio two boats and they were talking one was called the steelhead uh, which was a smaller wood boat and another boat called the coho second and they were talking and uh, I remember the fellow on the steelhead's name was Dave, and the fellow's name on the coho second was Ted. And uh, Dave asked Ted if uh, he was going in. He said yes, he was. Coho second was about uh, 56, 58 feet long steel bait boat, and uh, the steelhead was about 46 foot wood boat, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Dave asked Ted if he would take a letter in for him. And uh, Ted come back and says yes. So um, in those days we used direction finders to find the boats where they were and uh, so he, Ted took a shot, on, a bearing on, on Dave and uh, ran over to him. Well the next thing we hear is Dave comes on the radio and said that Ted just shot him. And, and the air went quiet and nothing, and then he comes on and says uh, goodbye. And that was it. So uh, nobody said anything for an hour, I guess. And then finally, a couple of boats ran to the area where they could see, and uh, Steelhead is gone. Call him on the radio, no answer, no nothing, he's gone. Mm -hmm. And everybody always had the radio on. And like I say, two channels, you always heard when somebody called you. Well, they called the Coast Guard and said something was going on here because the steel had disappeared. The guy comes on and said he shot, a guy shot him. There's only one person on the Coho Second, mm -hmm. one person on the steelhead. Mm -hmm. So the Coast Guard finally comes down, tries to board the Coho Second, but he, the owner will not let anybody on board the boat. So the Coast Guard tells him that he has to head for San Francisco and they're going to follow him in. Well, they followed him in all the way, right behind him, all the way to the Golden Gate. Mm -hmm. And they noticed the boat steering erratic. And they called him and they asked him to stop. No answer. They pulled alongside, the guy had to jump on board the boat, nobody on the boat. It's gone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So that was one of the unusual things That's that, unusual. that took place out there. And, and, uh, we don't know what happened. Hmm. Nobody really does. Yeah. <clears throat> hmm. They think that uh, there was something going on that uh, uh, nobody knew about mm -hmm. on the beach. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> Family matters. Um, you mentioned uh, AM radio. And uh, probably when you started in 39, there was, would you have a compass? And we had a compass, and I think we had like a Sears radio that, yeah. I mean, we could listen to, uh, couldn't hear boats or anything, mm -hmm. you know, no yeah. short wave or anything like that, but just a, and it was battery operated, I think, battery, mm -hmm. six volt battery operated radio. That's all we had. So how have uh, electronics changed fishing? Oh, right? tremendously. You've seen it all. Yeah, tremendously, yeah. Mm -hmm. With this boat even, uh, we were one of the first boats to get a radar. Mm -hmm. And we used to leave here, go up to San Simeon, or vice versa, be in San Simeon and come down here in pea soup fog and have 10 boats following us, in oh. the, following a boat with a radar. <laughs> I did the same thing before I ever got mine. Yeah. You know, and the fathom meters and everything, the, everything has changed. The yeah. radios and everything. And I'm amazed how computer literate most commercial fishermen oh, are. Oh, yeah. You yeah. guys are some of the first to some of the, get into PCs. I, I don't know what the percentage of boats in Morro Bay that have uh, laptop computers and mm -hmm. on them now, yeah. you know. Some of the guys that you swore would... Uh, never have anything like that they they've got computers yeah they've got navigational systems in the computers and, mm -hmm. and all the software for that for yeah. fishing yeah. yeah i know you're computer savvy you're yeah, yeah. The, the the boat next to me here i think he that 
uh, computer system that he has for getting the water temperature it cost around thirty thousand dollars. Oh, is that right? Yeah. He was one of the first ones. Mm -hmm. The uh, that's what that antenna with the right there is. Mm -hmm. But he uh, he was one of the first ones to get the uh, the water temperature charts right from the company in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Mm. And that really paid off for him because the fish are definitely on the water edges on the breaks. The, you know, two or three degree difference is mm -hmm. where the fish will be. Mm -hmm. Because you get an updwelling, you get an updwelling there, and that's where the feed will be, and that's where the fish will be. Yeah. Mm. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, anything else you'd like to add? Not really. Mm -hmm. Not really. I, uh, I've enjoyed fishing all my life. I, uh, I was very fortunate, very lucky to do what I did. I raised my family, paid for my home, made a good living. Mm -hmm. Didn't get rich, but I made a good living, and I really enjoyed it. I, I hate to see it come to an end, but uh, like everything else, it has to. <laughs> well, I hope you're wrong on that count, Jack. Well, I don't mean yeah. that way, but I mean as far as my <laughs> own understand. personal fishing life is yeah. uh, it's about over. So. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you got in on a, on a really great time to, to be a commercial oh, fisherman. Oh, yes, yeah. I couldn't have been, the timing couldn't have been any better, yeah. you know. Because this is beautiful. I mean, that's, I, I'm not a commercial fisherman, but I spent enough time offshore. It, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's a wild environment. And yeah. It's not for everybody. No, if, certainly not. If you can cope, it's... Uh, yeah, I bet it's wonderful. number of crew members that prove that. Not for everybody. Yeah. Well, it's yeah, it's a revolving <laughs> door, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> what do you look for in a good crewman? Well, a guy that can cook? No, nah, not necessarily. I I did most of the cooking all the time myself, but I uh, just somebody that's on the ball and mm -hmm. mentally alert. You yeah. know, that's the main thing. Mm-hmm. I've got their eyes open all the time. Not afraid to get dirty. And that's about it, really. Anything else, Chris? He was about 10 years old. He's right there. Nine. Nine years old. About the same as me. Arthur, can you tell me when you started taking him with you? It was probably during the summer. Yeah, it was. School vacation. School vacation. Uh huh. Well, not. It wasn't so much uh, weekends. It was uh, during summer vacation, because uh, summer vacation usually started about the start of albacore season. And uh, him and my older son both did this about the same thing. I think my older son was about 11 when he first went with me. It was kind of hard to get them, uh, get my wife's approval to get him on the boat and take him, because she was worried all the time, you know. She was worried enough about me, let alone taking the kids and drowning them too. But we, uh, they enjoyed it. They loved it. I don't think any of them, uh, either one of them, ever got seasick. They, uh, it was like a natural thing for them. They didn't mind being out there for a week and a half, two weeks, and fishing albacore. Would your son like to come out for a moment? Sure, or? Johnny, come here. Yeah, I'd like <clears> to <throat> know what what kinds of things they were able to do as they. To learn how to handle themselves on the they boat, fought a lot. The gear <laughs> they fought a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they get bored. <laughs> I'd see fist fights going on. Hi, Johnny. Hey. How you doing? Good. I'm Steve Reebok. Nice to meet you. Before us, see Matthew and Monica Hunter. Hello. Hi. Just kind of, uh, you know, you're going to be taking over here. We're uh, Darlene, and kind of want to get your impression. That's a good thing to do, I think. Yeah. I've been very fortunate. Yeah. Beautiful boat. Yeah. How old are you? 39. 39. So you're about one of the youngest guys in the fleet now yeah. around here? That's, yeah. That's one of the things I notice. Not a lot of young guys in the, the no. business. No, not, not anymore. Um, Disappearing. So you excited about being the captain? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's pretty great, I think. Yeah, yeah I ran it for Albacore season last year. Mm -hmm. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty good. Fish salmon, too? Yeah, I will, yeah. Mm -hmm. If there's any around. Yeah, cross your fingers. Yeah. I thought they'd be jumping in the boat last year. But I know, I 
That's what I know. <laughs> the day before the season starts, they disappear. So. It's peculiar, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's really strange. Well, can we talk about how you learned to fish from your dad? You watched them. Yeah. That's about it, really. So just being out on the water, and just going out for, you know, you take off for two, three take, weeks. Two, three weeks. So you didn't really. When you get, got started, did you actually have a job on the boat that you actually did, or you just were there to I was see chummer, how it, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, say, say it again. I was a chummer. I was the one throwing the live bait. Oh. That was my start. You want to move the mic? Yeah. Can we put a mic on you? Yeah. Here, take mine. Yeah, Dave? No, no, you guys are more that important there. I'm just here for decoration. Yeah. I hope to. Well, you know, my dad quit fishing abalone when he couldn't get 40 dozen. Yeah. <laughs> so the guys that hung in there didn't get it 5 and 10. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everything's a cycle, usually. And I would think, too, that, you know, the way people are marketing fish now, they're taking better care of them. And, uh, yeah, we sell them off the boat, water. too, yeah. a lot. Yeah. So That's that helps. That. I bought a fish from me a couple of years ago at the Harbor Festival. How do you like doing that, working with the public? I like that. Yeah. I like it a lot. It's any, a lot of education involved in it. You tell them where you caught it, how to cook it, you know, and they always come back. Yeah. So. I recall, you know, when that started a few years ago, it was people just wanted to buy a filet or a steak, and now they're buying whole fish. So. Yeah. Well, he, used to, he sold 12 ton off this dock here. 1977. Yeah, 1977. He's been doing it a long time. So. But we wouldn't cut the fish. We, yeah. we sold whole, whole fish. fish. People that were canning. Yep. Well, to me, you know, there's a great potential there. You know, it's just you're selling a better product, you're yep. educating people. And, yeah. You know, it's a good thing. Better price. Better price, yeah. yeah I, that's where I buy uh, probably 99% of my fish is off the boats down here. Yeah. I'd rather see you guys get them. That's good. Well, I tell my friends, too. It's a better deal. Yeah. Better fish, better price. You know it's you, fresh. You guys do better, so everybody wins. I guess some, maybe Bonds doesn't win. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> they, get cereal. they make it up on hamburger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so do you fish alone, or how many, how many people does it take to run? Uh, I've gone out alone, but usually two. Two to three. Albacore, three sometimes. My girlfriend goes out with me. Does she like to fish? Yeah, she's a, she loves it. Her, she worked at Burgess for five years. Oh, okay. Her grandfather was one of the first charter boat operators out of Morrow Bay, Mike St. John. Oh, yeah. of course. That kind of runs in the family. Yeah, yeah. runs in the blood. Yeah. yeah. it does. So you're at least third generation, Johnny. Yep. Yeah. Possibly fourth. Yeah. <clears throat> I think they were doing it in Denmark too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Probably a pretty good chance. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's excellent. So, uh, what's going to make it better for your career, Johnny? Oh, some canneries in the United States would be nice. <laughs> Less regulations. Product. You think uh, specialty canneries like, like uh, Driscoll's? Driscoll's? Yeah. Help? Yeah, and uh, Starkist would be nice. To, mm -hmm. A big cannery. Yeah, they were here when I moved to this. Yeah. Place. 26 canneries in uh, Terminal Island mm -hmm. when I was little. Yeah, well, that's a lot of. Well, that's good. You've seen that too. So. Yeah. I grew up, you know, in the good times, I call it, you know, too, so I've seen the difference. I know what, what it can be. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think it's good to have that vision somehow that uh, you remember. If you don't know those things, then it'd be easy to be pessimistic. Yeah. yeah. If, if you have that particular vision, it's easier to be a little more optimistic. Right. About the future. <laughs> change. It's all in how hard you want to work. You know, it's. You have family yet? Yeah, I got two boys. Huh? Yeah. How old are they? Uh, 15 and 16. Oh. So old enough to have been out. Uh, oh, they've been trips. fishing, yeah. yeah. What do they think? They like it. Yeah. Yeah. They going to school? Yeah. yeah. They live in Cavina. Uh, oh. Yeah. You going to go to college? Yeah. <laughs> I think, yep. I'm pretty sure of it. More and more, I meet a lot of well-educated fishermen. Oh yeah. I know one local heart surgeon that uh, came back to fishing. So <laughs> it can happen. School teachers. Yeah. Stockbrokers. Maybe that's an easy one. <laughs> yeah. Freeman invented the autopilot. Was a professor at the University of Washington. Hmm. He was a fisherman. Yeah. Summertime. Well, you know, I, I took my kids to Mount Vernon. Time you ever been there? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. This place. Mm -hmm. And on the grounds there's a fish house. Oh yeah. And you know it's hanging from the rafters of the fish house. Uh. Gill nets. Oh yeah. <laughs> they gill netted the Potomac River. Yeah. yeah Washington did. <laughs> so there's hope. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm always positive, but f from what I see, I uh, it doesn't do much good. It, I mean, just in my outlook, there's lots of fishermen here that have done a lot for the fisheries, but I just uh, uh, I don't know what's going to happen here. Environmentalists are out of control. You know, it's uh, I'm just concentrating on catching fish. So. One thing at a time. Okay, well, we, looks like we just got a few more minutes here. Uh, any more thoughts, uh, clo closing thoughts? We sell fish here from May 1st. Yeah, in end of end October. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you plan to sell. You sell fish. Yeah. Right off the boat. Yeah. And people like it. Oh, yeah. yeah. They mm -hmm. love it. How many people do you get down here on the weekend? Well, we have uh, Mark over there. Is He does a lot of radio advertising and emailing and things, which we don't get involved in because we don't want to get... We don't want to create a problem down here with too many people, but we were happy to selling the fish off the boat with the people that are walking by or whatever. But uh, it can get crowded, it can get overcrowded. It can get where a person can't even work on his boat if he wanted to, so we'd rather keep it kind of quiet. Semi-low profile. Sam, semi quiet. There's been discussion about maybe using Thailand in this park. Yeah, the it, there has park. been. If if. It, if it keeps like it is, where uh, people can't work on their boats, and there's that liability factor here of getting 30, 40 people on a float over there, and like which was brought up at the meeting that you attended there, I think you were at it too, where this boat here lost its reverse coming into the dock and w went through the dock up into the rocks. I mean, if that happened, it can happen anytime. It's happened to me before, not on this boat, but on another boat. And you got 30 people standing on that float there, you got problems. Jack, let me ask you something. When, when a problem like this develops, and things do, things change, and you know, uh, the way people work through these problems, um, it's obvious that if something is changing, the situation is starting to develop. How can you guys?
guys get together and sit down and figure out what's what's a good way to go and get some agreement on how to make the change rather than you're waiting until an accident happens. Well, that's kind of the way it goes here is that things won't change unless there is a problem. That's one of the bad parts about it. We, we've tried and it doesn't seem to do much good. I believe, I, personally, if a person has to uh, advertise on radio, email and all that is kind of in a desperate situation, I'd say, then they belong someplace by themselves, either in a store or Titans Park, or someplace where they don't interfere with other people, you know. That's not what these slips are for. We're very fortunate to be able to sell fish off the boat. It's a privilege in a town like this. Yep. Well, you got a lot of support from the county when they uh, yeah. uh, went to the state and, and appealed on your behalf. That's yeah. why I thought mm -hmm. it was pretty good. You know? But the thing is, see, that, uh, like uh, my son said, that we did, we sold, I think, forget what it was, seven or eight ton of fish off the boat here in about a week and a half off the end of the South Tee Pier uh, without cutting one fish, without cleaning it or anything. 